Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and I really, really love the movie Wonder Woman. It's so great to walk into a new superhero movie and just be like, yes, they got it right. I can't wait to spend hundreds of dollars on sequels and team-up movies and cosplay. Yeah, I think I can pull off a Wonder Woman romper. Anyway, in this video, I'm gonna go through the whole movie and break down every little detail that shows why this was a great movie. Easter eggs, influences from classic films, history, mythology, interesting visual choices. And this should go without saying, but yeah, spoiler spoilers ahead, go watch the movie, spend money on it so they keep making more good movies like this. All right, go, 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 go. Okay, let's get started with the opening images of the movie. As the camera swoops in from a cloud-covered planet Earth to overhead shots of present-day Paris, we hear this interesting voiceover from Diana. I used to want to save the world, this beautiful place. But the closer you get, the more you see the great darkness within. So the camera moving into Paris like this reveals Diana's cynical perspective as this movie begins. The planet is covered in clouds, masking its true nature, with Diana doubting whether it's even worth saving. Remember, this opening scene takes place probably shortly after the events of Batman vs Superman, when Diana was still pretty skeptical that mankind had any redeemable qualities. And the goal of this movie is to take Diana back into her memories, who remind her of the time that she was first inspired by the courage of man. Mankind. And once we get to the Louvre, there's a reference to that darkness simmering within mankind, the Dark Knight himself with this Wayne Enterprises truck. And right away, we get our first possible Easter egg here. Let's zoom in on that license plate, JL828BZM. Now, some people are saying that JL could be a reference to Justice League, with the numbers referring to Superman issue 82, which is the issue that Superman returns. So maybe this is a hint that in Justice League, those little pieces of dirt won't be the only things rising out of Superman's grave. Or we can look at the rest of the numbers and letters on the plate and just assume this is all random, but that's not what we do here. We're paranoid nut jobs. Okay, moving on. The story goes back in time to Diana's youth on Themyscira. Now, as you were watching these scenes, you might have wondered how exactly this all-female society works. Like, without men, how do they know anything about reproduction? Really, the Amazonians don't need men. Just like in the Wonder Woman comics, Diana is crafted from clay, and all the Amazonians age very slowly. The director, Patty Jenkins, clocked adult Diana Diana at 800 years old in this movie. And that makes a super interesting coming of age story for Diana. Like when we first meet her, she's a wise, strong Renaissance woman. She's already a superhero. But in this story, she's more of a fish out of water with her naivete coming from leaving this pastoral utopia where women can do whatever they want to a different, dirtier, more patriarchal civilization. And for me, one of the more interesting parts of this movie was Hippolyta's bedtime story to young Diana, explaining the history of the Greek gods and the Amazonians. And I really love Patty Jenkins' choice to convey this in a visual style similar to Renaissance paintings. Greek mythology was actually a very common theme for Renaissance artists, so Jenkins used a visual reference from art history to make the Amazonians feel part of our world as well. In case you missed this, during this sequence, Hippolyta mentions how mankind at one point enslaved the Amazonians, leading to Zeus giving them their own hidden paradise, and this could be a reference to Hercules from the Wonder Woman comics. Hercules, also known as Heracles, isn't really a good guy in the comics, like Hippolyta beat him in a battle, but then she offered to feast him and his men as a token of goodwill, but then Hercules drugs her and steals her girdle and enslaves all the Amazonians. Nice going, Hercules. Okay, moving on to Diana as an adult, played wonderfully by the wondrous Gal Gadot. Isn't she a wonder? There's a cameo here by boxer Ann Wolf. She plays Artemis. She's the badass warrior who takes a hit to the back and then tosses the other warrior. She's also the last warrior that Diana beats before taking on Antiope. Now, Diana's bracers here are so powerful because they're actually made from the broken pieces of the Aegis. That's the shield that's carried by Zeus and Athena in Greek mythology. So it's the power of the gods that allows her to blast away Antiope and all the others here. Then we meet Steve Trevor, played by Chris Pine, who's painfully funny in this movie. I'm sorry. He crashes his plane in the waters outside the island, and Diana rescuing him underwater and smiling down on him on the beach is a near shot-by-shot -shot homage to the sequence in The Little Mermaid, when Ariel saves Prince Eric from the shipwreck. Patty Jenkins actually listed The Little Mermaid and a few other films as influences for this movie, and I'll get to those when we come to them. And then when the German soldiers arrive, notice how the name on their ships is the SMS Schwaben. The Schwaben was actually a real-life World War I era ship, and fun fact, in 1905 it replaced a ship called the SMS Mars, which is 
is the Roman name for Ares, the main villain in this movie. Now, I loved this beach battle sequence. It was one of the most beautifully choreographed battles I've ever seen in a superhero movie. But besides the amazing leaps and swings, a big reason why this scene works so well is that we're emotionally engaged with it through the eyes of a character. Like, notice how Diana hardly participates in this fight. Instead, it's all shown from her perspective behind the rocks. She witnesses the strongest warrior she's ever known fall victim to bullets. According to Patty Jenkins, that was all by design. Really, every action sequence is from her point of view and for her story. She witnesses a battle on a beach that rocks her world and changes her understanding of what warfare is. Okay, moving on to Steve's interrogation using the Lasso of Truth, which gets a new name in this movie, the Lasso of Hestia. In Greek mythology, Hestia is the goddess of the hearth, family, and domestic life, which is interesting because it's like this movie is implying that the honesty forced out by the Lasso is kind of a foundation for a family structure. Also, a little history here, the creator of the original Wonder Woman comics, William Moulton Marston, also went on to invent the systolic blood pressure test, which was a key component in the polygraph. So I guess this guy's kind of obsessed with people telling the truth. Tell the truth! And then notice the interesting design of these thrones. These golden spirals reflect the shape of the lasso. Also, they're a contrast to the normal straight edge thrones that we normally see. Instead, the circular spiral reflects the never-ending immortality of the Amazonians. And then Steve's confession takes us back to his mission on the Ottoman base. Now, this movie takes place during World War I, which of course is different from Wonder Woman's origin in the comics, which is during World War II. Now, some people are saying that's because we already saw a period piece superhero origin story in World War II with Captain America, the first Avengers. But Patty Jenkins actually said that World War I was the first time civilization as we know it was finding its roots, but not something that we really know the history of. Jenkins called it a mechanized war where you don't see who you are killing. And those concepts of military industrialism and death on a mass scale are big parts of this movie. We also meet the main villain, General Eric Ludendorff, who was actually a real life German historical figure. But his character in this movie seems more based on the Duke of Deception from the Wonder Woman comics. He was an agent of Ares who tricks Wonder Woman into thinking that he's Ares. Also, he inhales these gas capsules to give him superhuman strength. And I could see DC Cinematic using this specific tech as a point of origin for other DC characters, maybe Bane, if they ever decide to reboot him as a character. We also meet Dr. Maru, Dr. Poison, who seems pretty closely adapted to the version in the early Wonder Woman comics. They even hinted at the character's eye mask with these goggles that she wears on the top of her head. I also appreciate the design choice with the World War I era face mask to cover chemical burns. In real life, many wounded soldiers actually wore masks just like these. You may know the character from Boardwalk Empire, Richard Harrow, wore something very similar. But in addition to this history, Jenkins said that she also pulled from retro adventure movies like Indiana Jones. And watching this old daring escape by Steve Trevor definitely feels like it could be lifted directly from one of those movies. Like sneaking out with a book and shooting up the place with a stolen plane. Okay, moving on, we get to see more of Diana and Steve's chemistry in this bath scene and then later on the boat. And then Diana says here that she learned about sex by reading all 12 volumes of Cleo's treatise on body and pleasure. No, that's probably not referring to Miss Cleo, infomercial fortune teller. Call now Steve Trevor and I'll show you a position that'll blow your mind. For real though, in Greek mythology, Cleo is one of the muses. The muses are daughters of Zeus and goddesses of the arts and culture. Cleo is actually the muse of history. So the subtle implication here is that the Amazonians look at sex so matter-of-factly, something that you'd read in like a history textbook. And I guess my history textbooks did have some pretty pornographic doodles drawn in them. Public school. Okay, moving on to London. Now the set designers did such a good job transforming the city into a polluted war zone, specifically to heighten the contrast with the mascara. Like Diana needs to experience that shift into a society that's obsessed with war. Specifically, notice this war propaganda poster on the wall behind them. Kitchen is the key to victory, eat less bread. This was a real poster printed during World War I to boost morale on the home front as all food was directed to the front lines. And this idea of a top to bottom war economy is so foreign to Diana, not to mention the image of a woman in a kitchen. But then next we meet Etta Candy. She's Steve's secretary, just like she is in the comics. And during this shopping montage, I really like this line. Oh, like she's not the most beautiful person in the world. Now this has to be a reference to Superman, the idea that glasses could make him completely unrecognizable. But speaking of Superman, according to Patty Jenkins, that movie was also a major influence. Specifically, this fight scene in the alley is a recreation of the scene in Superman when he extends his arm in front of Lois to block the bullet and catch it. Actually, Chris Pine said that him shaking his hands in pain here is another reference to Indiana Jones and those fight scenes. Also, a lot of people are comparing Diana's flex pose here to another iconic propaganda 
propaganda poster, Rosie the Riveter. Like Wonder Woman, Rosie went on to become an icon of female empowerment. Okay, fast forwarding past all these scenes at British Intelligence, I just quickly gotta give some love to Chris Pine's comedic delivery here. His timing and facial expressions as he wraps the lasso of truth around his wrist perfectly grounds all the magic and the mythology that Diana brings into the movie. I am taking you to the front. We are probably gonna die. This is a terrible idea. Next, we meet Steve's motley crew of fighters, including Samir. Now, this isn't explicitly said in the movie, but Samir is part of the Blackhawks, which was an old DC comic that also came out during World War II. It's about a group of pilots and commandos of mixed nationalities. Now, when the team departs in the King's Cross train station in London, there's a quick moment when Diana tries ice cream for the first time and loves it and tells the guy that he should be proud. Now, this exact exchange is in the New 52 comics, as well as in the animated movie. You should be very proud of this achievement. And speaking of the comics, I already mentioned the original William Moulton Marston version, but the modern depiction of Wonder Woman was created by George Perez in 1987 reboot. If you look closely at the credits, you'll see that Perez actually received a prominent thank you. Okay, moving on to the war front. The team is smuggled in by Chief, who's a Native American. So between Chief and Samir and Charlie, the idea here was to expose Diana to a diverse group of men to show that this wasn't just a war fought among Americans and Europeans, but a truly world war. And the filmmakers also made the smart choice to not shy away from the psychological horrors of that war. World War I was considered one of the first wars that people began to realize that soldiers were taking the war home with them. So it's important for Diana to see that Charlie is suffering from PTSD in the form of night terrors and anxiety. Notice how the camera also lingers on a returning soldier who's clearly suffering from shell shock. All of these little moments are designed to build Diana up to a boiling point on the front lines in the trenches when she's tired of being told that she can't do anything about this. And real quick aside here, apparently there's a cameo in these trenches by Batman vs Superman and Justice League director Zack Snyder. He's somewhere in the background dressed up as a soldier, but I haven't been able to spot him. Anyway, moving on to the big moment, Diana climbing out of the trenches and out into no man's land. This is such a powerful, chill-inducing image. Like the idea of reimagining a past war with a super heroic figure who just says, screw this, I'm gonna do something. This is a big part of why movies like Inglorious Bastards and the first Captain America work so well. And Wonder Woman really pulls it off here. And like the beach battle earlier, the viewer is emotionally invested in this battle because it stays with Diana's point of view as a character. Patty Jenkins had this to say about it. And then she comes to man's world and she sees a war that everybody says is impenetrable and nothing can be done about it. And she says, what am I gonna do about it? And let's be honest, a big part of the excitement of the sequence is the music. And actually there's a whole secret, super interesting origin story behind the composition of this music, the hidden meaning behind it, how Hans Zimmer and the other people who worked on the music of this film came up with it. And I made a whole other video that goes deep into that. So go check it out when you get a chance. Okay, then Diana's rescue of the occupied town of Veld is also so well executed. Like she lifts and flips the armored car, which could be a reference to the 2001 Wonder Woman comic, Spirit of Truth, where she lifts a tank. Also notice how the scene ends. Steve uses a chunk of metal as a shield to launch Diana into the steeple to take out the sniper, which is the same move that Steve Steve saw Antiope use in the beach battle earlier. So in a way, Steve is honoring Diana's aunt, showing her that he remembers and has learned from the Amazonian's world. Okay, moving on, when they celebrate the liberation of Veld, Steve jokingly refers to Themyscira as Paradise Island. Now that's a reference to the original name of Diana's home in the comics. It was referred to as Paradise Island throughout the Marston run until Perez rebooted it and came up with the name Themyscira. Later, there's another fun missable reference to Wonder Woman history as they sneak into German high command. Diana Diana steals her blue dress from this fussy blonde German lady who's listed in the credits as Falsta Grables. In the comics, Grables was a Swiss Nazi operative who tries to capture Wonder Woman, but she's kind of more well known from the 70s TV show where she has similar blonde hair as in this movie. And I don't know about you, but when Diana was like standing next to her sizing her up, I kind of half hoped that we would cut to the gala and just see Diana walking in and wearing this woman's skin. Like, ah, this I can fight in. <laughs> oh. I ripped it. Then later, when Ludendorff tragically gasses the town of Veld, this is another key moment that reveals the real horror of World War I. An estimated 100,000 to 260,000 civilian casualties were caused by chemical weapons blowing into nearby towns and villages. And even though no direct strikes of this kind were reportedly ordered, there is historical evidence of soldiers knowing that the poison gas might affect local women and children, but not being concerned because they were still targeting the enemy. And again, this horror is an important 
important step in Diana's growth in this movie. Like later, after she kills Ludendorff, thinking he's Ares, she sees that the soldiers are still mobilizing weapons anyway. And she learns that mankind is inherently flawed, outside of divine influence. So it makes her decision to fight for them that much harder for her. But I gotta say, I was pretty impressed with the reveal of the real Ares in this film. It's Sir Patrick, played by David Thewlis. Here, he plays a spin on the classic mustachioed villain. Like, if you look back on the movie, his offer to run the operation in secret out of his office was really just an attempt to keep tabs on their whereabouts. And then when Steve was talking to Sir Patrick on the phone, Diana concludes at that moment that Ares is Ludendorff. When she was so close to the real answer, Ares was on the other end of the phone call. There's a couple missable references that come up in the scene with Ares. First, when Diana ties him up in The Last of Truth, Ares says, I am the god of truth. And this seems like it could be a reference to the comics, specifically the god killer arc of Gail Simone and Bernard Chang's Wonder Woman series, when Ares says, war is truth and creepily licks the lasso. Then Ares shows Diana a surreal vision of the paradise that he wants to build after wiping out humanity. And this moment is parallel to that scene in Man of Steel, when Zod tries to tempt Superman by showing him an illusion of his post-humanity world. Next, this emotional farewell between Steve and Diana on the airstrip is an homage to another classic film that Patty Jenkins mentioned, Casablanca. He's looking at you, kid. But just like how that alley scene was a reversal of the Superman man scene, this is also a reversal. In this version, the guy leaves on the plane. Now, Steve's sacrifice, flying on the plane carrying the gas canisters and detonated it out of harm's way, seems like it could be a nod to the end of The Dark Knight Rises, which makes me think that maybe Steve could have ejected at the last second and parachuted down somewhere. Like, I think we need to get Lucius Fox in here to check that plane's autopilot. Oh, it's World War One, and airplanes don't have autopilot or ejection seats? Oh, he did. Moving on, the Armistice Day celebration in London includes a few little Easter eggs. Next to Steve's photograph in the memorial, there are photos of real-life British war poets Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Their poetry actually brought to light the psychological toll on soldiers returning from war. I should say that Sassoon didn't die in that war, though. He died in the 60s, so it's a little weird that his photo is up on this memorial. And that brings us to the closing images. Back in the present day, Diana writes back to Bruce, thanking him for bringing Steve back to her. And this trip down memory lane was what Diana needed to enlist her into this next world war, the war for this world, which we'll see in Justice League. In fact, in the final seconds of this movie, if you listen closely, you can hear a boom in the distance followed by sirens, leading Diana to suit up and dive into battle. This could be the arrival of Darkseid and his parademon army, and it's possible that Justice League will open on Diana in the middle of this battle. And this brings me to a lingering question for you guys. Did Wonder Woman live up to your expectations? Like, do you agree with all the great reviews in the praise that this is the best DC cinematic movie? Or did that hype raise your expectations a little too high? Let me know what you think in the comments. So this video has an amazing sponsor and I'm so excited about them that I'm gonna do this shout out as Miss Cleo. Now this video was brought to you by our friends at Verve. Verve is a really great service that pulls together a ton of great content channels like Crunchyroll, Funimation, Rooster Teeth, Mondo, Tested, and Cartoon Hangover. All you got to do is download the Verve app on your PlayStation, Xbox, Roku, iOS, or Android device, where you can watch a ton of great stuff, great anime, which comes subtitled or dubbed. I've been watching Attack on Titan Season 2, and even Miss Cleo can predict what's gonna happen next there. I also enjoy shows like Adam Savage's One Day Builds. Adam Savage, I tell your fortune, you'll keep busting those Miss Honey. Verve is a really amazing service. Just go to vrv.co slash go premium to start a free seven day trial, honey. And I want to keep this conversation about Wonder Woman going. Like, I have a ton of thoughts about it, and I want to make more videos about it, but it helps to do that if you comment, like this video, share it, subscribe to New Rockstars. You can more directly help us make more videos like this and have a say in what those videos are by contributing on Patreon. Thanks so much to all of our current donors, especially my man, Chris Kell. Tweet your thoughts about Wonder Woman to me at EA Voss, or follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.